Our speaker this afternoon is Dr. Carolyn Parsi. Carolyn is a neuropsychologist at the University of Washington's Medicines Memory and Brain Wellness Center and an assistant professor for the School of Medicine. With that, I will turn it over to Carolyn. Thank you very much. And I will bring up my slides for you here. All right. Everyone see that okay? That looks good. Fantastic. Uh, thank you for joining me uh, today, everyone, for uh, the, sounds like the first uh, virtual event, which is exciting, and what a appropriate topic for today then. So I will be talking today about technology for memory loss and daily living, and in the context of this talk, we'll be using some of that technology to give you this information. So I do put out a couple of disclaimers whenever I give a talk like this, that I don't necessarily endorse a particular product. A lot of the products and the brand names that I'm going to be talking about today are merely examples, uh, not receiving reciprocity or any sort of financial um, insight for, for any purchases of any particular brands. Um, there will be a lot of new information that I'm providing to you today. And I want to remind you that you do not need to take frantic notes and that the slides with clickable links will be available after this presentation and you can um, take those and, and work through them at your own pace. So kind of relax and just take the information in um, as it comes. So what I'll be talking about today, a little bit about cognitive impairment and cognitive changes, gonna fly over that really quickly. Um, it's, it's worthy of an entire uh, other talk, so I'm going to breeze through it today and really jump into some of the available technologies and strategies that are out there for you to use in your everyday life. And then something given the context of what we're, or the scenario that we are in right now with the virus, I also wanted to give you a little information specifically about staying connected and using technology to stay connected during this time where we're being asked to stay home and social distance and how we might be able to carry those strategies forward when and if we're able to get out of our houses soon. So let's first jump in and talk about what is cognitive impairment and what is cognitive aging. So when we talk about normal cognitive aging, we know that the brain changes just like the rest of our body. We're not as quick to think when we get older. It might take us longer to remember something or have occasional difficulty coming up with words. We might need more reminders or cues to help us pull information back up. And so we might have that experience of, oh, right, we did book that appointment, or oh, yeah, we did go to that party. Those are all pretty normal things that come with aging. We tend to see more attention problems rather than memory problems in people who are just normally aging rather than people with an actual neurodegenerative disease. So this is what that looks like on an aging timeline. So we see that normal aging represents this green arrow, these two green arrows, where we see some slight cognitive changes over time, where we don't see normal things is more on the blue lines and the blue then leads to red. So we see mild cognitive impairment or MCI is kind of this gray area, a little bit of a gray zone of where cognitive changes are a little bit worse than we would expect for normal aging, but they're not impacting daily functioning. And then there's dementia, which is further down on this bar, and that suggests where cognitive challenges are actually impacting our ability to do things independently. So things like driving, managing medications, finances, things of that sort. So I like to give a good definition of dementia because I feel that this word gets tossed around a lot. And the, the true definition of dementia is that it's an umbrella term to describe when cognitive problems or cognitive changes impact everyday life. You've probably heard words like Alzheimer's disease or Lewy body disease. These are all causes of dementia. So they are the disease processes that cause cognitive changes that impact daily functioning. So Alzheimer's disease is the most common cause of dementia, 
usually uh, folks will say count, it accounts for about two thirds of dementia cases, whereas other types such as vascular, um, Lewy body dementia or frontotemporal dementia account for smaller um, portions of dementia cases. So that's the very short version of, of cognitive change in, in aging and in abnormal aging, so in, in uh, degenerative process. And so what I want to spend most of today talking about is what we can use for technology to try and help with some of those cognitive changes, both normal aging and abnormal. So first, I want to just start with the most low-tech or even non-tech version um, of some of these strategies, which includes things like a whiteboard of something that is in a place where you will see it often. Uh, the kitchen is a great option or a, um, a spot right by your door if you're coming and going and just organizing it with information, maybe drawing it, this is an example over here, drawing a line down the, down the middle and saying on one side, I'm gonna have just the things I need to know about today. And then on the other side, more of a bigger outlook of what's going on next week or this month, big things, maybe birthdays or holidays, um, trips or, or plans that I need to consider in the future. And just having that little bit of organization can help us get, stay oriented to our daily activities and those things that are coming up soon. I also like to recommend that folks keep, infer, or keep things in the same place. When we have routine, and structure, it's easier for our brains to remember where we put things. If I always put my keys in a basket and that basket is not gonna move, I know that when I say, oh darn it, where did I put my keys? The first place I should look is the basket because more than likely they should be there. Um, I also recommend some sort of planner, organizer, calendar, a little of this depends on your perspective and your preference of how you like to organize things. Some people are very savvy with their phone or Outlook on their computer. Others still like to handwrite everything. The medium in which you write things down doesn't matter so long as it works for you. So uh, I'll leave you with a couple of those. I'll consider them kind of low tech options before we switch into a lot of technology heavy um, pieces. So some of the things that are out there uh, for our daily organization, um, we're gonna first start with things at home and finding things, because this is a really common challenge that I hear from folks, which is I can't ever find my fill in the blank. And there are a couple things that you can do. Two products that do the same thing are called Tile or Cube, and those look like these little guys down here. So these are little, tags that you can attach to any item. So in this case, they put them on their little wallet, uh, on the end of their umbrella. You could attach it to a purse or anything like that. And then on your, on your phone, you can tag these things. So then you say, oh darn it, where did I put my purse? And you push the little button for your purse. And then this tag is gonna tell you on your phone where it is. So whether it's somewhere in your house, or whether you left it at your friend's house or it's still in your car and it will pinpoint it on a map for you. So those are two different options, Tile, Mate, and Cube. They're competing companies, um, but they do the, essentially the same thing. Um, again, with competitors, you will see, you've probably heard a lot about Amazon Alexa or Amazon Echo is its bigger brother. Uh, and Google Home is the equivalent to Amazon Alexa or Echo on a different platform. You might also have heard of Sonos, which is another smart speaker. That's what we call these, or smart speakers. And so these are speakers that sit in your house and you can talk to them and ask them to do things for you. So if I said, Alexa, please remind me to take my medications at 2 p.m. today, and I can say that while sitting at my dining room table, Alexa will hear me and then register that there needs to be an audible reminder at that time later on. And so when that time comes, then Alexa is going to say something to me of, of, here's a reminder about taking your medication. It, it appears that it's time to take them. And so you can use them for simple things like reminders at, at certain times. You can ask Alexa for information. So Alexa, tell me the phone number for 
insert your favorite restaurant and Alexa will give you that information and then you can use that to call. So it's a, it's a medium to go through your computer or through another system. And Google Home does something very similar, uh, just with a slightly different platform. In this case, they have a little box. This is the Google Home Hub. And then these little dots that um, hang out in different rooms that are the speakers so that they can hear you in different rooms. We also see lots of options for communication. So one of uh, the older options that we have are just phones that are pre-programmed with people's numbers. And so these are speed dial, but based off of visuals. So you can use an actual photo of the folks that you know and love, and you can pre-populate their phone number in those different numbers so that you just have to push one button of that person's photo and it will call that person for you without having to remember their number. Um, you can do it by visual for their photo. So those are what we call memory phones. Um, and then there's lots and lots of wearables now, including emergency watches. You probably heard of the lifelines, the necklaces where you can push if you're in trouble for safety. We also see a handful of things that look a lot like regular watches or regular items. And these are available to you and have different types of safety features. So Tempo um, is one option. Lively is this uh, set up here that's very specific for safety and falls. So if that's something that if you're if that's something you're worried about or something that your doctors have been interested in having you monitor a little bit better, um, that's an option for detecting when somebody has fallen if no one else is around to help and can do an automatic call to 911 or another, um, another pre-programmed safety net to check in on you. Dr. Parsi, real quick. Absolutely. We, we have a question. Um, yes. Are there security concerns around using any of these devices? Oh, this is such a good question. Uh, so the answer is yes. There's, there's security concerns with anything that we use when it comes to technology. What I recommend is going through the privacy and security settings for anything that you get. It's very easy for us to go in and just click and say, okay, to the privacy list, the print is in size two font, um, and just skim through it and say, yes, okay. Um, go back and look at those safety and privacy settings. I believe later in this talk, I have a link to a very nice, article that was written by AARP. And they talk about some of the technology and information safety. And I would definitely guide you toward that. It's a very nicely written document um, online that gives you information of how to go through and check safety and, and privacy settings. So excellent question. And yes, there are resources to help you stay safe. Um, all right, so other things uh, to help you. Medications are another common question that I receive. So how do I make sure that medications are taken and at the right time? There are a plethora of options with automated pill boxes now. Um, anything where you have a simple 28-day dispenser and it just uh, hits an alarm once a day and it just pops open the little um, the little compartment at that time. If your medications are simple enough that it's only once per day, something like this can be helpful. If your, comp if your medications are far more complicated than that, um, there are more complex uh, systems like the MedMinder here, which divides each day into four different compartments. So maybe breakfast, midday, dinner, and before bed for example, and those can all be pre-programmed for the times that you need to take those medications. Um, there's also slightly lower, lower tech on one end, but not the other. There are a lot of pill packs that are coming out of pharmacies right now, which I absolutely love. Um, these are where the pharmacist is pre-packaging the medications that you need for the morning, the midday, evening already, so you don't have to think about it and sort it all out. Sometimes they come in strips, other times they come in little boards like this. And now there are programs for your phone that can tie these two pieces together. So it'll have a, 
some sort of an app on your phone where you can get the reminders and then it will look exactly like the actual card on the phone versus on your actual medication. So you can color code and look to where the right color and the right day to make sure you're taking the right medications. So it's something to ask your pharmacist about because it's gonna vary depending on your insurance and where you get your medications. There's also some other things that you can do. Um, these are a bit uh, kind of depending upon how you get your meds, um, but there are prescription timer caps where it's just a timer on top of the actual bottle and it's a countdown for how long it's been since you previously took your medication. So if you have to take your medication every eight hours, it's an option where it will just do a countdown for the time interval that you need in between. We also have options that are just reminder systems that are similar to an Alexa or a smart speaker that just give you reminders that can be recorded by a family member rather than, or yourself, uh, rather than um, a smart speaker voice, so a Siri or an Alexa. There are a handful of options for GPS, so navigation and wandering can become a challenge later in life. Uh, we like things that don't have to be remember, you don't have to remember to take them with you. Because uh, half the challenge sometimes is, I leave my house, but I don't have the thing that will help me when I get lost. So things that you don't have to take with you or remember are even better. So we like things like the pocket finder. Uh, this is something that can attach to your key ring. It can attach to your purse or a wallet and it's always gonna be attached to that thing unless you actively take it off. And that way you don't have to remember, it's just automatically on the item. And then if somebody, if you get lost or you don't know where you are or a loved one gets lost, then they can go and figure out based off of a phone app or on their computer where that pin is on a map for the GPS of where those keys are or where that item is that you are with. There's also some more high-tech things that have come out like the Smart Sole, which is a very high-tech shoe GPS. It's an insole that goes into your shoe. So if you put those shoes on, if you left your house without shoes, I don't know what to do, but if you leave your house with shoes, at least we've got those with you. So uh, a couple of options there. Kitchen safety is another, uh, another uh, challenge and there are a lot of options. I'm gonna talk about just two primary things um, that come up. One is that darn stove and forgetting to turn it off. There are a handful of options that do auto shut off, which is a safety um, precaution. So if you walk away and it's been too long and it notices that there's a lot of heat, it might give you an alarm saying, hey, you've, you've walked away from the stove for quite a while. And whether you need to return to that or whether it will just automatically shut it off if there's no response. Um, and that way to prevent a fire if it's something that you walked away from for quite a while. Another thing that I hear about is just scalding. So if that water temperature is too hot on your shower, on your sink, um, I know at my house, sometimes what happens is if my husband is in the shower and I'm in the kitchen, my kitchen sink gets hotter than it normally would. Um, I, my water heater's in overdrive. And what we can do is use specific spigots and spouts that monitor that temperature and they have a cap for how warm that temperature will be so that we don't accidentally scald our hands or our body when we walk into a shower or wash our hands. So I'm gonna transition a bit from physical items to a lot of the apps that our smartphones have. And there are tons and tons and tons of these apps and they are constantly coming out with new ones. So I do my best to stay on top of this, but I feel that every minute or two, everything I say is outdated. Um, so bear with me. Uh, these I have checked and they're still available. Uh, these are things that are still working, still highly recommended. Um, so first and foremost, talking about medications, there are a handful of medication and healthcare management apps. I really like MediSafe. It's a very pleasant uh, platform. It's very clean. It's not cluttered um, and it's easy to navigate. There's also others like MedHelper or CareZone. 
most of these apps are taking your information that you put in. So it could be your medication list. It could be your health risks. So if you're somebody with a strong health history of uh, diabetes or cardiovascular health to help your doctor and communicate those things to your doctor. It can keep it all in one place. There's also a handful of apps for folks who are caregivers of people with memory loss. The Alzheimer's Caregiver Buddy was created by the Alzheimer's Association and it's a handy app to have on your phone. It gives you some tips and information about managing behavior or particular symptoms and it also has a direct connection with their 24-7 hotline. Um, for the Alzheimer's Association for help. And then there's a handful of things like the First Aid by American Red Cross that gives you some basic first aid information, kind of handy, uh, something were to happen. I'm also a fan of Caring Bridge, which if you are somebody who's assisting with helping someone with memory loss, but there are other people who are doing, who are assisting too, so a, a son, a daughter, a friend, it can connect you. It's kind of a social network that connects you with that person so you know what that person, so maybe this person has an appointment today and you say, I'm taking them to that appointment, but you're taking them to their haircut tomorrow. It's a way to stay organized uh, for that information and everybody has the same platform and same information. This is what MetaSafe looks like, just to give you a visual. I like it because it's very pleasant to look at. Um, so this is an example of the medication list. So what they've done here is, for example, maybe you have a medication, maybe you're, you're taking Plavix and it'll prompt you and it says that you're supposed to be taking it at 5 p.m. You should be taking one of those pills with food and hey, your next refill is due in about 10 days. So it just kind of keeps it on your radar um, that I need to refill or call my pharmacy or not. And whether you take it, you can click the checkbox or you need to skip it for some reason and you can hit the X. So and then you might have a list of the medications that you're currently taking. Then it gives you some information and more of a visual perspective of what medications you're taking at the different times of day. The other thing that I am guilty of is uh, losing your car. Uh, so trying to figure out where did I park my darn car uh, a couple of apps that are available for you, as well as myself, uh, including Parking and Parking Pin. This visual is an example of Parking Pin. So if you're driving in downtown Seattle and all, this, all the one-way streets look the same, you can drop a pin once you park your car and it will save where you have parked your car so that when you go and you wander Pike Place Market and you go to the museum and whatnot, then five, six, 10 hours later, you say, oh darn it, where's my car? You can look at your app and say, ah, it's here. And then you can follow the path that it gives you so that you go to the right location and find it later. Um, highly recommended. Uh, and then other options for other things to find, find my iPhone, which is for obviously iPhones, but there's also a Android version if you are operating a Samsung or a Google Pixel or another type of phone, an HTC or something like that. Very similar, so it can find where your item is. If you go to a computer or another person's phone, you can go and you can find where your phone is. And then again, I talked about Tile and Cube, those little um, tags that can go onto items and, and align with the app. There's also plenty of options for transportation. So you're probably familiar with Uber and Lyft. What you might not be as familiar with is this concept called GoGo -Go Grandparent, which means that you can use Uber and Lyft without an app. And so if you are like this gentleman and more prone to be willing to call something with a, with a phone number and you don't wanna deal with apps and that's way too much and I don't have a smartphone, perfect. We can, we can still get you an Uber or a Lyft without a smartphone. And you can do that through GoGo -Go Grandparent and uh, you, you dial the number and then they actually make that connection for you to Uber and Lyft and coordinate that pickup and drop off for you. So if you're not as tech savvy and, or just don't wanna deal with it, there's, a, there's just a simple phone option for you. If you're a public transportation person, Move It is a good app to have on your phone, gives you lots of ride alerts, um, 
changes in uh, based off of construction or um, uh, reroutings. I know that it gets updated when we have like snow days or things like that that cause changes in bus schedules. Um, so it's helpful to have uh, as well. For other apps for safety, one of the most coveted and one that has been around the longest is called ICE, which stands for In Case of Emergency. This app has been around, I think, almost 15 years now, a very long time. Um, it has evolved and it is much more high tech than it ever used to be, but it, it used to just be your health information and emergency contacts. So if for some, think of it like a, an app that's uh, a high tech med bracelet. So it will be able to tell an emergency personnel person that you are diabetic, that you, um, you have a pacemaker, and here's who you need to call, my daughter, my son. Um, it's, a, it's an option um, for your phone. There are also a couple of GPS options. Life360 is um, this guy over here, and it's a way to keep track of everyone in your family. This became really popular with kids and, and parents who are having their kids walk to school and just making sure that they get, you know, the mile and a half to school or whatnot. Um, so you just need everybody in your family to download the same app and you connect them and then you can figure out where everybody is. So if someone's headed off to go to dinner, another person's headed off golfing, I can make sure that everybody gets to the right spot can be really nice for caregivers or loved ones who are in um, another city or another state, um, just so they can be assistive uh, in any sort of emergency. There are a handful of options for fall detection. I talked about a couple of the safety features um, that are for wearables. Now Apple and on Apple Watches actually has a fall detection um, device where it uses the accelerometer to determine if you have fallen very quickly. And if you, if you do, you have an emergency of just, oh my gosh, I need help. And I, you know, I can't get up. I can't call someone myself and you have an option or I fell, but I am okay. And so I don't need the emergency um, call. So that's all stuff for, for kind of everyday uh, activities. I also want to acknowledge that technology can use, be used for leisure. And this is something that has come up a lot more in the context of the past couple months. Um, so I wanted to give you some options for things you can do from home to stay engaged cognitively, socially, things like that too. Uh, leave you on some positive notes as well. So lots of classes are being offered right now either at free or at discount as a result of all of us staying home and trying to promote us doing more. So the University of Washington has the Osher Lifelong Learning Institute. They offer a variety of classes for folks 50 and above. Um, the Seattle Community Colleges, both at cent or all at Central, North, and South campuses are all offering community education either virtually or uh, in anticipation of being able to be open um, soon. I'll just say soon, I hope. Uh, and then Seattle Parks and Recreation has an incredible lifelong recreation program. Uh, they've recently opened an LGBTQ specific um, recreation called Rainbow Recreation um, in collaboration with the AgeWell group as well. There are also lots of free things you can do from home. Lots of free courses are available online. One of my absolute favorite classes that has been offered and still one of the most popular classes on this platform called Coursera is the Science of Wellbeing. This was put on by Yale University. It's available all the time. You can log in, you can do it at your leisure. You can do half an hour, walk away for a week, do another half hour. You can do five hours in a row. It's all up to you. It's all free, my favorite price. And Coursera is, has lots and lots of different options. So you can do classes on art, you can do things on computers, you can do things on literature, and they're all taught by actual professors at universities. There's always an option to pay for a certificate skip it, you don't need that, just take the free class. It's like an audit um, and it is an option. You're not skating out of anything. 
Um, edX is a similar platform. I just have less familiarity. I've been using Coursera for my own interests um, for 10, 15 years now. Um, Harvard University also does something similar. And then something also that has become really big in the past couple months are virtual tours for museums and arts, symphonies. This is really exciting. Uh, so these are a handful of options that are available. I'll remind you that don't worry about writing all of this down. We can get you the links later. These are all active links um, to get you to different virtual museums, both within the US and overseas. So there's within, especially within Google Arts and Culture um, website, they've done and taken these 3D videos and, and navigation through different museums. The Louvre is on there, the Museum d'Orsay, um, the National History Museum, and then a handful of music groups as well have been putting on free concerts or hosted live events or um, uh, content that is just static that is staying on their website, different uh, philharmonics and operas. So check those out as well. And then a handful of online concerts. NPR has been ma managing this online concert list. Just about every couple of days, they just keep adding more and more to this growing list. So it's this evolving document as artists are coming out and saying, I'm, I'm willing to do a free concert. Here's how to access it. So. Good stuff. As the daughter of a librarian, it would be terrible for me to not tell you about your local library. Um, I am a big fan of the library and what it has been doing lately. Um, not just the ebooks, audiobooks, digital magazines, all the stuff that you would expect, but other things. And they've gotten really creative. The librarians, at least at Seattle Public Library and King County Library Services, have been doing podcasts lots of interviews with um, local and uh, international artists and um, authors and poets. And so you can listen to those um, podcasts, which is just like an interview, an online interview. You don't need any fancy um, equipment for it. You just click the little link and you can listen. There's online book clubs that you can join if that's something that you enjoy, kind of has that good social connection with it. I'm a big fan of Your Next Five, which is a, a, a program, free program that Seattle Public Libraries offers where you tell the librarians you, some of your favorite books, genres, authors, and they sit around and through their magic power, they come up with five possible books that you might enjoy. So kind of your next five books to check out. Um, so I've really enjoyed, I've taken part in that for several years and really enjoyed it. Found some really neat authors that I might not have otherwise picked up. And then something through Seattle Public Library and King County Library is that they are offering through Silverkite online art classes for people over 50. You go to the Seattle Public Library or King County Library service, either one and you go through their website, they have the link to it and it'll get you in. They're doing a class every day uh, in the afternoon, which is kind of like a follow along. They've been doing drawing, painting, um, more like origami and paper arts, great stuff, all free. So also for exercise and things of that nature, um, there are plenty of apps that will encourage you to do Plenty of intense things and less than intense things. So we have MyFitnessPal is one of the oldest apps out there that combines fitness, food logs, recipes, exercise. It's a workhorse of an app. Um, you can also do things that are more guided, like pocket yoga or daily yoga will give you guided uh, instruction of how to do a simple maybe five or ten minute yoga routine in your home. So things that don't require a lot of equipment, which is good. Uh, especially right now. Stress reduction, mindfulness, and meditation are all things that we encourage for cognitive functioning and staying uh, sane uh, during stressful times. There are a handful of apps out there. This is one, uh, breathe to relax. And this is what this looks like. You follow this little bar of how to inhale. So as if like you're bringing your air up and then pushing your air down. So it's a nice visual. Um, Headspace and Calm are two more recent companies that have come out with apps as well. 
And then ambiance is just good white noise or soothing sounds at night if it's hard to fall asleep and white noise is helpful. Also, there's a couple of other apps that I don't, they're miscellaneous. They don't fit in very well anywhere else, but uh, here's a couple of options. Magnifying glass with flashlight. Yes, that is what it's called. That is what the app is called, folks. The, it does exactly what it says. It makes things bigger and it turns on your flashlight. If you have ever been to a restaurant that is super dark and the print on the menu is size two, this is the app for you. So it will magnify the information on that menu and it will brighten the light so that you can actually read it and you glide along that menu and you can read it with some sort of ease. Big Buttons Keyboard is what this looks like over here. It does exactly what it says. It makes the buttons on your phone bigger. So if you have thumbs that aren't the size of a three-year-old, it might be difficult to text. Guilty. So this is sometimes helpful if you want to be able to text a little bit better with bigger buttons. Silver Surf is an option to get your phone to have a higher contrast. So the have um, uh, so for some of the contrast issues, when you have a light background and a light font, it's harder to differentiate those colors rather than having something like this, which is yellow and black and white. So this can help with some of the contrast issues or zoom and making displays bigger on your normal phone. And then plenty of options of text to speak if just texting and typing is difficult. There are plenty of uh, voice to text options and a lot of them are now embedded in phones too. So some practical advice. I just told you a ton of things uh, about, about uh, different devices and technologies. Choose one uh, at a time. Don't go full force and try and do everything at once. You will get frustrated, you'll get upset, you'll be mad at me. Um, too many things can be overwhelming. So just one thing at a time. Use it early, use it often, practice, 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 right? The more that we get acquainted with something, the easier it becomes. Be kind to yourself during that learning process. It's difficult to learn something new and then be perfect at it immediately. Be kind and allow yourself to make mistakes and stumble through it. Ask friends or family. A lot of kids and grandkids love to help um, with different technologies. Most of the kids that I meet now are way better with phones than I am. Um, it's amazing. And then just find what works for you. So not everything is going to work for you that I mentioned today or work for the next person. I want to take a couple minutes to talk specifically about socializing over uh, different platforms, different technology platforms before we wrap up today. So you've probably seen a lot of the video call platforms. We're on one right now called Zoom. There are, if you're an iPhone user, you have FaceTime. If you are a Android user, you have something else. Uh, and so it might be Google Hangouts, it might be Zoom, it might be Skype, it might be WhatsApp. Um, these are all different options. But so there are ways to connect us with our loved ones visually and on video. What's fun though, is that you will notice a variety of quality of how people present on video. So a couple of things to keep in mind for good video communication is to try and use a stand or something stable to hold your phone or your tablet or your computer on so that you're not flying all over the screen. It's very disorienting to the person on the other end. When the background is moving a lot but your face isn't, it's a very weird sensation. Try to avoid bright light right behind you. You will come across as a shadow or kind of this silhouette. And then people can't see your face, kind of defeats the purpose of having a video call. So don't put yourself right in front of a bright light. Try and find something in between. Try and arrange your camera at eye level so we're not doing this and we're not looking way down like this. And instead, it'll help your neck and it will also help so that it looks like you're actually looking at the person. If it's really difficult to hear, plug in earphones. Or if, you're, if your microphone is a little bit challenging, just go for the headphones. You can now do a lot more than just talk on these different platforms. You can read stories, you can play games. 
Um, there are lots of authors who have been doing online book reads for kids, but you can also volunteer to do this and actually record yourself doing a book and then they can share it, you can share them. Um, I've heard of people doing family talent shows where their grandkids are practicing their talent all week and then they get everybody together on FaceTime or Zoom and then each kid gets to do their little talent and then they hold up little cards of, you know, nine points, 10 points. So there's ways to be interactive with these calls. It's just not just talking. Um, I love the idea of gratitude practice and being grateful for things that um, might go otherwise kind of unnoticed. And Gratitude Jar is a way to do that in a public forum. Um, it's just anonymous saying what you're grateful for. It's just this running forum and you don't have to put your name on it or anything. You can just put it out there of, you know, today I'm grateful for my family. Today I'm grateful for the sunshine. Um, and it's a way to see what other people are grateful for too. And this is uh, something, if you haven't seen this already, you, you should definitely check this out. The Sofa Singers. Uh, this is uh, what it looks like. There's this group who gets together once a week and they coordinate themselves and sing together. It's amazing. It's about 500 people per week around the world. Check it out. It's fabulous. Uh, it'll just bring a smile and joy to your heart. Um, lots of other group activities too. Netflix Party came out about a month ago where you can watch a movie with someone else. So it's happening at the same time. If I have Netflix and my friend down the street has Netflix, we can sync so that we're both watching the same movie and it's kind of like we're hanging out or as much as we can because um, we're watching the movie in real time together. Watch Together is similar, but it's for YouTube videos or online content rather than Netflix. If you have grandkids, Caribou is this app down here. It puts up a game or a story, and then it puts up your videos next to each other. And so you can read to them or have them read to you. So you're all seeing the same story, and but they can see you at the same time. And House Party is an option. This is what this looks like up here. House Party uh, has, this is their Pictionary. And so you can, uh, it pulls up a screen and I join with two of my friends and then you can, it gives you a prompt. In this case, it says you have to draw a bonfire. And then with my finger, I try and draw a bonfire and that's what that squiggle is. And then they, uh, other people have to guess. And so you see their, you can see their faces and you're doing a, a game in real time with them. That's free as well. Also low tech, no tech. Uh, so writing letters to family and friends. Uh, there's some programs that are also out there if you don't, um, if you have, just wanna write to somebody, um, active duty military, a lot of our first responders. An example, Operation Gratitude, um, you can write letters. Writing poems or short stories. Uh, I, had a, I have a patient who's been doing a lot of poetry shared. And so he'll write a stanza, then he sends it to his friend who then writes another stanza who writes it on to another friend. And they've been creating these poems in this group and then sharing them at the end, which I think is a really neat way to stay connected and still make something and, and be creative. Um, sharing music with each other, there's creative conversations and coming up with interesting ideas to, to talk about as well. I always want to leave folks with information on virtual support and our social groups that are available. Um, Memory Brain Wellness Center, which is where I work, um, we have a handful of community programs that we've been putting on more and more are virtual now. Um, most of these are typically um, uh, in person and right now we can't be together so we have put everything online. So we have our informal virtual coffee chats that are happening once a week. Our community wellness talks have been happening twice per week since the beginning of April. And then we have caregiver forums that are happening once a week as well. All the information is available at that link at our website and specifically under our community events and programs. Everything's free. Uh, and then all specific information from the Alzheimer's Association, a couple of different things. So they're offering a lot of uh, telephone support groups for those who, who can't get into their, their in-person group. The Alzheimer's Connected Forum is a way to have a virtual forum or a virtual platform to ask questions of other caregivers. 
And then we also have, they're also offering a lot of really great webinars, kind of in a very similar format to what you're doing right now. So if you can do this, you can do that. Uh, and they're offering different things. So for behavior, for um, just uh, stress reduction and all, a whole variety of things. So they're also available uh, here and they're all free too. This is those com virtual community wellness talks that we've been doing at Memory and Brain, if you're interested. Um, our one this morning was Enjoying the Arts from Home. Dr. Lee Burnside uh, put it on, it was lovely. Um, the, it, the recording will, we've also been recording all of these as well. So they're, they're online for you to check out at that website up here. It'll get you to, to the recordings. Um, I'm giving one this afternoon, or not this afternoon, this Friday, uh, on virtual nature for the soul and how to bring the outdoors inside uh, for times when we can't get outside right now. So lots of good information there if you're interested. I want to thank you and also put a shameless plug out that our memory hub is opening soon. And uh, this is our construction has been a little bit delayed but we are hoping to open end of summer or early fall. And one of my projects is I will be getting technology classes up and running, free um, options to learn new technologies, troubleshoot things that you, you know, I can't figure out this darn tablet, um, demonstrations of new things that have come out, some tech talks. Um, those will all be hosted at the Memory Hub, which will be on First Hill near Harborview. More information uh, is available through that link where it says Memory Hub, but if you're interested specifically in any of that development, shoot me an email. I'd love to hear what you might be most interested in learning so I can cater some of the things that we'll be doing. So I know I just hit you with so much information, but happy to take questions. Uh, and always, you can, you can send me emails as well if it doesn't pop into your mind right now. Thank you, Carolyn. We really appreciate your time uh, today. And I would like to thank our audience members as well. If you or your loved ones would like tours uh, of the gardens at Town Square, as soon as we are able to give those, we will definitely do that for you. So just pop us an email. Um, as a reminder, again, we will be sending out some surveys. Please take your time, fill those out. Let us know what worked, what didn't, because we wanna be able to do these uh, in a more ongoing fashion. Um, so again, thank you again, everyone for joining us today and um, have a wonderful afternoon.